Hello and welcome back here live on EAO channel. We're live from Lisbon, the 2019 Congress, and we're very glad you're joining us for a second episode of the Breakfast News, where we look forward to what's hot, what's new, and what's happening in the field of implant dentistry. And this morning, I'm joined by two very renowned speakers. Gunnar Kalmeter from Sweden, you're a professor in microbiology, and this is actually the first time you're here at the EAO Congress with us. And next to me is Weil Ad, you're a professor in postodontics from Boston in the United States. And both of you will be speaking tomorrow, actually in a parallel session at 11 o'clock, about two very different topics. Uh, Gunnar, you'll be talking about microbiotics, and all we need to know. And uh, well, you'll be talking about uh, zirconia, zircomania. And uh, exactly. what we'd like to do in the next 30 minutes or so is kind of explore the key takeaway message for our audience. And since we're live, if you're watching this and you have any questions, use the feature of the live chat to actually send in your question to us here in Lisbon and I'll relay them to our speakers. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. So Gunnar, let's start with you, a professor in microbiology. What brings you to the Implant Dentistry Congress? Well, first of all, it was an invitation to come and speak. And the topic I was given, and my favorite topic, is really about um, antimicrobial resistance in bacteria. Yes. And um, everyone suffers sooner or later from bacteria. Yes. And if bacteria can be treated with antibiotics, you can be cured. If they cannot be treated because of resistance, you may be in trouble. Exactly, especially, I guess, in, in the mouth, there's a very lively uh, microbiotic system, both good and bad, especially when we're extracting tooth, when there's open sources. This is a key topic. Now, the title of your talk will be Antibiotics, Globalization and Bacterial Resistance. So what does this globalization term mean in, in the title of your speech? It really means that both bacteria, resistance genes, and people travel more and more. Yeah. You have vacations, you have refugees, you have uh, relocations, and we exchange bacteria with each other. And that means that resistance that develops in, let's say, China, is in Holland the next day. So that's globalization for you. And, and what does that mean to your specialism? What does it mean to the field of microbiology? Well, in, in, in the field of infections, it means that basically no one is safe. Uh, if we travel to, let's say this time, Cambodia on holiday and we eat the lovely food they give us there, our gut flora will change in a day or two and when we get back to wherever we came from, we carry those bacteria with us. Yeah. And the next thing we do is we help old Mrs. Johnson with her leg wounds or with her teeth or whatever and there is a risk that we will transfer the bacteria that we brought with us from Cambodia to Mrs. Johnson in, let's say, outer London or in Rotterdam. Exactly. So it really is a globalization of infections, of bacteria, of resistance genes, and of people, of course. So now you're actually highlighting the, the, the dentist or clinician patient relationship. So I, I might be uh, unconsciously uh, uh, contaminating someone. Absolutely. So that's the yep. so first yep. thing I should be aware of. Yep. What else are your, are your takeaway messages of your talk tomorrow? Well, the takeaway message is really that the world is lost. We don't have <laughs> strategies to, to counteract this. We have put up some strategies, but they're not working. Um, For can you give an example uh, of a strategy and what are we well, doing? Well, one of the strategies we have put up since 20 years or even more is that we need to reduce the use and misuse of antibiotics. Exactly. Strong and push for the that. the occasional country. Uh, actually succeeds and has managed to lower the use by 10% or 5% or 1%, but on the whole, it's actually increasing. Okay. And people who should have antibiotics are not getting them, and people who shouldn't have antibiotics are getting them. So the strategy is not working, it's not sharp enough, it's not, it's not based properly in legislation, etc., etc. Okay. So that's then, one strategy. Yeah, that's one strategy yeah. that's failing. Yeah. What, what else are we trying? What else we're trying is really to improve conditions in our healthcare institutions, hospitals, old people's homes, to counteract the dissemination between patients and inmates, whatever sort of institution we're talking about, yeah. and between staff and patients, uh, between relatives and patients. Try to break the counter-dissemination uh, 
of the resistant bacteria. And, and of course, that's a lot of hard work. Yeah. It means a lot about uh, you know, having hand wash opportunities, etc., etc. And it works sometimes, but it's not really working full out. Yeah, and I, 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 I can assume that's a weak system because if it po fails at one point, yeah. the whole system yeah. is gone, right? All yeah. right. So what does it mean for our dentists and clinicians watching? What, what should they take away from your talk and, and change when they come back to the practice next week? Uh, to be quite honest, um, I'm sure this is of importance in dentistry and especially in, let's call it sterile dentistry, where you operate under sterile conditions, where the patient is at risk because you're sort of inside, truly inside the patient, um, then it does matter. We have MRSAs that may cause infections, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, um, and we have other bacteria that may cause infections. I think in general practice, it means that um, increased focus on, let's call it general hygiene, um, using gloves when gloves should be used, washing hands, steri um, uh, uh, using uh, hand wash when mm -hmm. that should be used, etc., etc., is of importance. And, and can we expect to see any exotic new developments in our patient's mouth? Is there any, anything happening there, or is it an infection just an infection and it should be treated? Well, basically, a anything that happens in the bowel happens in the mouth. Um, and um, vice versa, I think, right? <laughs> and vice versa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and if you give a patient antibiotics, and this has been known for 60 years, um, if you give a patient antibiotics for whatever disease, um, the bowel flora will grow up into the mouth. Okay. And we will start to find E. coli, Klebsiella's, and bacteria that we normally don't see in the mouth, in the, in the, in the mouth flora. Uh, if those are then very resistant, of course, then they will appear as very resistant also in the mouth flora. Yeah. So the system hangs together, and I suppose that's part of the globalization as well. Yeah, as well, and I guess then you're kind of working against each other because you might be fighting the first infection, you give antibiotics and you complicate yeah. matters in yeah. a, in an yeah. yeah, yeah, okay, interesting. Well, and I've, I've seen cases where you know you give something, um, you give an antibiotic for a very simple infection, and it sort of kicks back at you at another place, and everything goes haywire and goes very complicated. Exactly. So this this should be a, a heads up for any clinicians and dentists watching yeah. that if they see stuff they don't understand, there could be a microbiotic yeah. thing going on. But I also think it's important that this is not only about our profession. It's about our daily life, it's about our children, okay. it's about our mothers and fathers in old people's homes, it's about our own health, you know, when we need a transplant or we need a, 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 a new bone marrow or something. You know, then it starts getting really difficult and we have seen transplant units in the, in the east, on the east coast of the US, for example, close down operations because of outbreaks of multi-resistant bacteria, moving patients to the west coast, and thereby also moving the problem to the West Coast exactly. eventually. So this is a tough one. And I think, I think it's just not for the professional life we lead, it's also for, for our private life. Yeah, and it's basically the area where they very much mingle. As you, exactly. as you show with the example, I might go on holiday yep. in an exotic country, bring it back exactly. to the practice. Interesting. Thank you very much for sharing that. Stay with us. If you're just tuning in, we are live from the EEO Congress 2019 here in Lisbon. And we're looking forward to some of the key hot topics that are being shared here by some of our expert speakers. And this morning, I'm joined by uh, Gunnar Kalmeter, who is a professor in microbiology. And I'm also joined by Weil Ed. And you'll be speaking tomorrow at 11 in a session called Zirko. Is it today? It's yes, today. It's today. Sorry, uh, no it's today. Well, our viewers online are not here, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> anyway. So you'll be speaking, speaking today in a session about zircomania. Where are we today? Well, well let's kick off with that. But let's, let's start at the basis, though, because I saw we have a lot of viewers from the Far East, a lot of young dentists. What is this whole debate about zirconia coming into the field? I think everything uh, <clears throat> is new. Uh, or relatively new coming to be introduced. It's a new into, material, right? No, actually it's not new. It has been there for a while. It has been transferred to dentistry from orthopedics. Uh, the material historically has been used for um, replacement uh, of hip joints and other joints, and then it came to dentistry. 
But um, why the whole hype now about uh, Zirconia is because of the possibilities that are offered to be in combined with this material. In other words, these are machinable materials. So okay. um, in conjunction with the advancements in digital dentistry and the whole digital workflow, it is now easier and faster to produce restorations from those materials and also be more efficient um, not only in terms of time, but at the same time in terms of finances. So it's becoming more and more attractive for dentists. However, um, despite this attractiveness, we're still gaining experience in a lot of areas. So there's no magic material that can be implemented for everything. Um, majority of the things that we are doing today are not based on really rigid evidence, I would say. We're doing today in, with zirconia, you mean? Yes, yeah. and not only zirconia, but also other materials. We have so many materials that are still in the experimental phase that it cannot be um, used or recommended for daily use. Um, zirconia in some medications is one of them. And if we think about the different types of restorations that you can deliver to the uh, implant patient, it can start with the zirconia abutment, it can go further with a single crown, can go for the fixed partial denture, and also for co complete rehab. So there's, from the dental industry side, there's, I would say, a great push in to implement more and more zirconia. Again, because of the um, easiness of manufacturing. Yeah, just, just to quickly check, is there anything wrong with titanium or porcelain, the materials we've been using in the past? Well, Except for the production challenges. Yeah, no, I, would, I wouldn't say that there's in terms of production challenges, but if you think about the whole workflow, uh, if you take a metal ceramic rehabilitation, then you need to manufacture this framework out of metal, which can be either casted or can be milled or can be also manufactured by means of additive technologies, selective laser centering thing, and then you need the lab technician to work on it. In other words, this needs time. Yeah. So um, for a full arc rehabilitation, of course, you would definitely need a week or at least two full days of work or three days until it's done if you're doing metal ceramic. Now, if we're going for a uh, monolithic zirconia without uh, veneering ceramic onto it, I mean, if you have a good lab technician that knows the workflow, it can fin be finished within one day or one and a half day. Wow, that's impressive. So it accelerates the um, manufacturing process. However, we still don't have the long-term uh, experience with it. We don't know what kind of complications are going to arise in the future. And we're still now um, waiting for clinical data to show us the performance on the long run. Because we don't know yet, you say, but from your background, is there anything to be expected? Where do, where do we expect risks? Well, um, what I say, or you follow dentistry historically, again, you will see every like five or 10 years, there's a material that will be introduced as the, the material that is going to solve everything. It's not the case. We'll continue this evolution. We started with the first generation of zirconia, which was the fully centered one. They introduced the second one, which was the partially centered. Um, they had downsides that they are very opaque, so they are not giving you that the aesthetic thing. But then they started to modify the material and then introduced the so-called translucent zirconias. They improved the translucency and the aesthetics, but what happened is that they sacrificed the mechanical resistance. Yeah. Yeah. So this dilemma between achieving ideal aesthetics and maintaining the uh, mechanical properties, it's still questionable. So for today, for every indication, the clinician has to be aware of what kind of material need to be used um, and uh, what, kind, what are the limitations, and at the same time, what to expect in terms of the aesthetic outcome. And this, again, there's no long-term evidence, but we still need to rely on the clinician's preference and experience in achieving all of this balance between these different components. Yeah. And when, when, when we read the session description and we read about zirconia, you see the benefits seem obvious, but there's quite some reluctance, resistance in the field of dentistry. Do you say that's valid? Well, I don't see that there is a resistance in dentistry. In, on the other hand, actually, or in contrary, um, dentists are willing more and more to, to do zirconia-based rehabilitations. However, there are some guidelines that you have to consider whenever you are using or considering the use of these restorations. For example, minimal material thickness, uh, the um, distribution between the implants should be good. 
in order to achieve also this thickness and prevent the fracture. If you are going to view for a veneering, you have to limit the veneering to a specific areas in order to avoid the inherent issue with chipping. So all of these parameters need to be considered. And the problem is um, not the material. I see that the lack of knowledge, either by the technician or by the uh, dentist, in considering these materials. So and if you don't have, I'll give an example. If you don't have enough bulk thickness of the material for a full arc rehab, um, it will break. And a lot of colleagues, they don't just recognize that at the beginning, that they don't have enough space. They just go for the zirconial break. But at that moment, they have to make a decision whether to go for a metal ceramic rehabilitation or alternative material that is more resistant and will guarantee the long-term stability. Okay. And, and so this is a key message that you have for, here, uh, for us here at the Congress. Where can our viewers go to, to obtain this knowledge? What, what is the center of expertise on, on zirconia and zirconia design? I think um, education is the most important thing. Um, the more that we are exposed to studies, the more we are exposed to the experience of our colleagues, the better we get in managing these cases. Um, attending lectures, attending courses, um, reading, that would be the most thing. And of course, um, not only for the dentist, but for the whole team. Yeah. So this covers the dentist, the technician, um, the exchange between them. This will enable better understanding of what kind of parameters need to be considered whenever we're considering any type of material, not only zirconia yeah. or rehabilitation case. So your key message is for the ac academic validation, we just need time. We need Mother Nature to do the work and, and have more patients with zirconia implants. And, and secondly, go educate yourself with the entire team on this material. Exactly. Yeah, yes. great. Well, thank you very much for sharing. Course, and yeah. good luck with your talk here today. Yes. Thank you. Um, in the meantime, if you're just joining us, we're live here from the EEO Congress in Lisbon. It's the breakfast news where we look forward with, with different speakers to their sessions. We started off with two speakers, but our third speaker has arrived. So I'm glad you're here. Luigi, please join us. Luigi Canulo from Rome in Italy. Hi. And uh, you'll be talking, you will be talking actually tomorrow morning about the topic of the abutment surface and the abutment yeah. surface modifications. Your, your session is titled um, or the session is changing shape of abutments and implants, future evolution. Well, Luigi, welcome. We're Thank very you. curious to learn from you. What is your key message in your talk tomorrow? What is the future evolution of the abutments? Okay, my idea is that um, so far we know a lot of things, but not everyone. Uh, we know a lot of things about uh, how the abutment uh, should be, but we do not know now not really so much about um, the soft tissue and uh, one of the key messages is that uh, we have to investigate the soft tissue in order to preview how we should uh, work with the uh, with the abutment and uh, additional key message will be also that uh, we have to control uh, uh, the microbiological environment when we insert uh, uh, the abutment because we have to really understand that uh, Every prosthetic maneuver should be intended uh, as uh, the continuation of uh, a surgical phase. So we need a surgical prosto. Okay, and you'll be sharing tips on how to do that? I will try. <laughs> you will try. When, when I read your session description, you talk about looking at the abutment at three different scopes, right? At the macro, the meso, and the micro yeah, level. I, I add, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, my, I mean, the, the, the macro, uh, morphology of the abutment uh, give us the possibility to manage the soft tissue appearance, but does not really interact on the integration of the abutment. What, does it, what makes the difference from my point of view is the prosthetic workflow, this is called one abutment one time, um, not really the bulk material, but uh, mechanic, uh, chemical, uh, um, biologic, uh, and uh, biophysic characteristic of the abutment. And last but not least, obviously, the, the macro, mi micro topography of the, of the abutment itself. Yeah. And, and what have you found about the uh, micro topography of implant? What, what is, what the is your view? Yeah, yeah, micro. Okay. What is your view okay. on that? We have done, the, I mean, I talk. Uh, on behalf of uh, a very huge group of researchers based between Rome and Valencia. But uh, 
um, what we have found is that um, a rough surface, a three-dimensional surface, a three-dimensional surface uh, could be uh, and help in soft tissue integration. Mostly if we use uh, a one abutment one time and we bioactivate the abutments. This is, uh, I mean, uh, a new topic, uh, the uh, surface energy of the abutment, which is, uh, for me, from my point of view, is a, a key factor also in the future. And uh, uh, we have done a lot of work on this topic, on, uh, on surface energy of the abutment. Yeah, but it, it's interesting, the reason why I ask, I have here on the desk something that's been shared here at the Congress, the Delphi study, Horizon 2030, and they interviewed many experts across the globe on many topics, and one of the questions is about this, and it's actually one of the outcomes where there's no consensus. So literally the question is, the microtopography of the implants, do you think it will be reduced roughness in the future or increased, and the world is divided, why do you think that is? Good question, good, really good question. Uh, I really think that uh, a traditional rough surface could be not the answer to this question. I, I could in, image, I could picture in the future a uh, moderately rough, micro grouped, uh, nanotechnologically designed surface by activated. That is my that is idea dream. of the future, my dream, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I don't know if it will be possible, I don't know if uh, it will really work in the long time, in the long term. My experience so far is that it works very well with a five-year follow-up. And when you say bioactivated, it means you precondition the yeah, abutment? Yeah, 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 precondition means to increase the wettability of the abutment. In fact, uh, um, if you have a completely decontaminated, sterile abutment, titanium, zirconia, whatever, they are microscopically perfect. But the interaction with the living cells, the interaction with the biology, is not really good. Changing just the surface energy, active bioactivating the abutment, uh, changes completely. The, the bioactivations uh, bring uh, the soft tissue to be uh, stronger, atta strongly attached, uh, to be um, increased, to, to increase the 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 the, um, the band of uh, connected tissue attached to the to the abutment, uh, and this is a. Uh, a clear evidence. Interesting. Well, you're, you're standing next to a professor of microbiology who started so, to so raise his eyebrow so because I'm starting to understand. Be, be, be kind. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> but because, you know, maybe you can elaborate a little bit. Uh, how does this work, bioactivated surfaces in soft tissue? What do you know about that? Very little, to be Very quite little, honest. Yeah. But I think, as a general rule, you could say that any manipulation in any body cavity or surface will automatically change the flora one way or the other. Uh, it may be problematic, it may not be problematic, exactly. and uh, it usually takes some time to find out. Yeah. Um, but it's very important to try to find out what is the least, um, which method, which material is the least disruptive to, to the microbiome uh, of that cavity or that uh, place in the body. It goes for orthopedic implants in the hip. Exactly. Uh, it goes for orthopedic implants in the knee, and it probably goes for implants in the oral cavity as well. Yeah. So basically, what you're saying, we have experience with bio bioactivated surfaces, and we're now bringing that to the mouth yeah. or to the implant. Yeah, I can. Yeah, add yeah. To that, it's. Um, I think it's not only about the surface con topographical yeah. configuration, but you have to consider the surface chemistry. Yeah the surface charge and the physical properties, all of these parameters should be considered in terms of um, the bioactivity of an implant surface or an abutment surface. However, the difference, I would say, between the hip replacement implants and the, um, the abutments in the oral Absolutely. cavity, they're exposed to so many bacteria. Yeah. It's not like when the hip replacement. If you get the infection here, it's done. It's here, they're constantly exposed. We have a biofilm that is um, rapidly formed onto the surface of the abutment. And there's this dilemma, if we just think about the um, topographical configuration or the surface roughness, you can go very rough, 
and you can go extremely smooth because if you go very rough, uh, the microorganisms will love that surface and will attach to it. If you go to extremely uh, smooth surface, then it will be difficult for building up a good attachment from the epithelial uh, uh, cells and the connective tissue. So we're still tweaking which one is the ideal one. And I don't think that the next few years will be coming out with a magic solution again. Ah. So um, I'm looking forward to okay. what you guys coming up with. So Saturday 10, 11, 30. yeah, 11, yeah. And, but would you say, does this make the life of implant dentists in the future more complex because there's more to choose from? Or are we working uh, you mean towards even more complex? Exactly. <laughs> or are we working towards a simplification where we will get the silver bullet, the silver implant, where we say one size fits all? What, what is your expectation? My expectation is that uh, as every uh, topic in medicine will uh, increase the will require an increase of uh, the skill of the surgeon, of course, and uh, the biology will lead us to a simplification of our procedure, but uh, you have to know the biology before. My personal opinion is that uh, uh, we will need more um, scholarization of, uh, of uh, our, our colleague, of, of us, of course, yeah, yeah. and uh, to, to uh, join new technologies to really have access and to really have advantage from new technologies. Interesting. It seems to me, if I listen to all three of you, the field is becoming more knowledge intensive, right? Because your key message is educate yourself on zirconia and all the developments. Your message is you should be educated on the microbiology. You're telling us how to educate. I think uh, we need some permanent education going on. Well, luckily, you are taking part in that here at the EEO channel. We're live a few times a day, so make sure you hit the subscribe button. Just to round up, if I would give you a magic wand, and overnight you could change one <laughs> thing in the field of implant dentistry, what would you change for tomorrow? I would, um, I, I'm not thinking about change, but coming up with something new. I think the ultimate goal is to be able to grow teeth again. Ah. This is, I think, would be the ultimate thing for all of us. Rather than having the implant, having the restoration onto it, grow teeth. So the, the, the ultimate future is there is no implant dentistry industry anymore. It's a teeth growing transplantation. Well, we'll industry. have another type of, of course. industry. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. this is the ultimate thing that I'm thinking about. Yeah, yes. grow teeth again. Yeah. And for you, Gunnar? Well, I don't think I have a vision for implants, so <laughs> it's not really fair for me to say. But maybe from you your know. field of microbiology, if you could say, well, ladies and gentlemen, this well, is my... I would share that view in that case to say that if we can avoid foreign materials, um, you know, foreign materials, wherever we put them, are always a problem uh, from a microbiological point of view. Uh, so I think if we could transplant teeth and get them to regrow, that would be fantastic from that point of view as well. Nice dream. Let's, let's inspire some young scientists to start working on that. And for you, Luigi. Yeah, very close to them. I, I, I will love, my vision is that we, 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 have, we will have a, a material able to get touch the soft tissue and to bone and to uh, living cells in our body, but at the same time it will be able to say microbioma, please stay away from me. Exactly. Real so. And have the benefits of 3D printing and digital workflows and all that stuff yeah, with it exactly. right away. Exactly. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Luigi Canulo. Thank you, Gunnar Kameter. And thank you, uh, uh, Well Ad. And thank you for watching all the way to the end in this breakfast news. Make sure you hit the subscribe button here on the EEO channel right now so you'll be the first to know when we go live again. And we'll do that multiple times here from the Congress or when a new video is published. And we, we, we just look forward to meet you at one of our future congresses.